Hey, Michael DDA here. Thank you for joining me. Torah, don't you just love it? I love learning Yehovah's words. And, and the best part, best part, maybe not the best part, but it's one of the great parts, is seeing the corresponding information in Yasher. Oh, my goodness. Oh, my Elohim. You are so good to have provided that for me. I've learned so much because of it. I'm so grateful. Well, last week, we talked about Joseph's road to Egypt. Do you remember what happened? Actually, in the last two weeks, we saw this. The, the brothers put Joseph in a pit. The Midianites took him out of the pit, went walking past the, past the rest of the brothers, and they said, what are you doing with our slave? And they almost came to fisticuffs. Worse than that, swords. But they had a big brouhaha and ended up selling Joseph to the Midianites for 20 shekels. Well, the Midianites were heading away from Egypt. The Ishmaelites were coming to Egypt and they crossed paths just after the Midianites repented of what they had done and their concern that if someone were to see this boy in their hands, they might think they stole him. Stole him. So they sold him to the Ishmaelites, same amount of money, 20 circles of silver. Then the Ishmaelites went all the way down to Egypt. On the way there, they stopped in Bethlehem where Rachel was buried. He cried over his mother's graves. Ah me, ah me, my mother, my mother. He got a word of knowledge, maybe a dream, maybe a vision from his mother, probably a vision. It seemed like it came from the ground, like she was speaking to him. We know that's impossible. But she said, go down to Egypt. Obey your masters. Yahovah has got your back. Well, the first thing he did when he talk, stopped talking to his mom was, says, was to uh, try and get the guys to sell him to his, back to his dad. Take me to my father and make you rich. But he didn't really pay much attention to what his mom said. But then they started beating up on him. And Yehovah made the land dark. It's very scary, very windy. Uh, and I forget some of the other things that were happening at the time, but the animals fell to the ground. They were not going anywhere. And the Ishmaelites repented because they realized that uh, it was because they were hitting on Joseph. That Yehovah is doing what he's doing to them. Well, uh, they apologized to Joseph and then continued on their way. Joseph forgave them. So Joseph really was assured a safe trip all the way down to Egypt. When the Ishmaelites got to Egypt, they sold Joseph yet a th one to a third time to the Madonites, another son of Abraham, but this time through Keturah. Remember the Midianites, no, I'm sorry, the Ishmaelites were from obviously um, Hagar, the Midianites and the Madonites, Midian and Madon, are both sons of Abraham through Keturah, sold him to the Madonites. And it was the Madonites who sold him to Pharaoh. The Ishmaelites sold him to the Madonites, again, 20 shekels of silver. But the Madonites, they had some connections in Egypt, and they sold Joseph to Potiphar for 400 shekels of silver. Mm, that was a really good investment. Well, we left with him being sold into Potiphar's hands. Now, surprisingly enough, this chapter 
this kind of a story about Reuben, no, I'm sorry, Judah, in the midst of the Joseph narrative. How does that work? Why is that? These are questions you have to ask yourself when you go through this information. How did this happen to be here and why? Who's Judah? He's the fourth born of Leah. Reuben, Simeon, Levi, Judah. Remember when Reuben, the firstborn, the Bekor, gets the double portion, sinned and went to, it looks like he went to Jacob's, was she a wife at that point? Uh, certainly she was a concubine before that, but uh, she might have been a wife by then. Uh, uh, Bilhah, slept with Bilhah. And because of that sin, Jacob took Reuben's blessing, his kingship, and his priesthood, and gave the, the blessing, the Bekor, the firstborn blessing, the double portion, to Joseph. He gave the, the priesthood to Levi, and he gave the kingship to Judah. And I think there's a transition going on here that all of a sudden we're turning to Judah for some reason. Remember, it was Judah's idea to sell Joseph. Here, let me read this to you. This is pretty interesting. I did not read this. A guy named Glenn McMillian Williams years ago wrote this for me, or wrote this, and I was listening to his teaching. I listened to a lot of teachers before I went on on my own. Kind of outgrew a lot of teachers. So um, we're going to come back to this. I want to talk about that word. It says he departed. We're going to talk about that word in particular. That's the word that New King James Version uses. Others use different words. But uh, it looks to me like it went. It means went down. Uh, we're going to talk about that in a second. Let me read you this note from Glenn McWilliams. Here it is on the right-hand side. Reuben is the firstborn of Jacob. Yet it is not he, but Judah, the fourth son, who rises to prominence in the Joseph narrative. It was Judah who suggested the sale of Joseph to the caravaneurs, and it was he who will soon become the spokesman for his brothers to their father. It is Judah. It is Judah who assumes the position of leadership when the delegation runs into Egypt, runs into Egypt, and who negotiates on behalf of the family for the release of the youngest brother. Finally, it is Judah whom Jacob selects to spearhead the migration to Egypt. So these, my, so these narratives, while they recount the rise of Joseph, that's what this whole story is, the rise of Joseph, subtly register as well as the ascendancy of Judah. There's kind of two storylines going on here. The stage is being set for future, for, for, for future fulfillment of the divine promise of Abraham. Kings shall come forth from you. You know, Judah, I'm Jacob making Judah the king, it was a fulfilling prophecy. It was, it was providential. And Jacob, kings shall issue from your loins. Both times it was about kings. Two kingdoms shall result from these divine promises to the patriarchs. Judah became the name of the southern kingdom, the kingdom of Judah, while the northern kingdom of Israel was known as Joseph, remember Joseph was was uh, uh, I forget his two sons' names. It'll come to me. The present chapter then provides a foil to the Joseph-centered episodes. It hints ever so obliquely at the future Joseph-Judah polarity in the history of the people of Israel. Now, before I leave this verse, 
I want to talk. We hardly said anything about it. I mean, read the verse, have I? It came to pass at that time that Judah departed from his brothers. Departed from his brothers. And visited a certain Adulamite whose name was Hira. Let me show you on the map real quick. Here is where the boys are at. The whole family really is at at Hebron, right here, Hebron. Dad, all the brothers, all the servants, uh, 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 Isaac's servants. I mean, the whole gang is there in Hebron. Here's Adulam. This is where an Adulamite comes from. Here's Bethlehem, where Joseph was crying over his mother's grave. Ah, me, ah, me. It says Joseph, Judah departed, departed. The word that we're talking about here is this word here. Yarat, descended, downward. You know, you think departed, you're thinking more about leaving. He's leaving his brothers. No, he's descended. He's going downward. There's something important here that we've got to understand. You know, this is why you got to look at the Hebrew to understand the full picture. In the very next chapter, look what it says. It says, now Joseph had been taken down. No, the word is Joseph. Yeah, uh, here it is, 38, 39. Uh, Joseph descended. It's the very, very same word, Yarad. Joseph descended to Egypt. He's not leaving, he's he's descending, he's going down. Judah is going down, going away, separating. There's something more that we've got to understand here. And I think as we begin to understand the context of this whole story, it's going to become clearer for us. Let me go back. He departed from his brothers, descended, went down, descended, went down. What is a better word? I guess descendants okay. It's not fully what he's supposed to have. And visit a certain Adulamite. Remember, the Adulamite lives in Adulam, whose name was Hera. Now, look what it says. And Judah saw, saw, the word they use there is what? Probably not all that important. I can't even get it. It goes off my screen for some reason. Ra. Judah saw the daughter of a certain Canaanite whose name was Shua. Let me ask you this. What is the daughter's name? Most would probably say Shua. But no, this is the daughter of a certain Canaanite whose name was Shua. The daughter is unnamed. And it says that he married her. What is the word they use for married? Here, look at this. The word they use is tuck. Tuck. Lakak. He took her and went to her. Came to her. The word they use for came is bo. Came to her. It's translated as married. He took her. When you Marry somebody, you take somebody to yourself. She becomes the. 
my wife, my woman, I should say my wife, my woman becomes me, bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. It says he went to her. He, he bow unto her. He came unto her. So she conceived. Oh, I got rid of the map. Here's a, here's a little bit more. Uh, yeah, she sure says, uh, and Judah. Oh, this is interesting. Remember, we don't know her name. Her dad's name is Judah. What's her name? Well, fortunately, Asher gives that to us. And Judah went to a, at that time to Adullam. And he came to a man of Adullam. And his name was Hera. And Judah saw there the daughter of a man of Canaan. And her name was Aliat, the daughter of Shua. Aliat is the unnamed woman in Torah, a Canaanite woman that a son of Israel took. Is that what we're supposed to do? I don't think so. Well, her dad's name was Shua. It says, and he took her and came to her. He lakot her and bow her and aliat bear unto Judah, Er, Onan, Shiloh, three sons. Abraham didn't want Isaac to have a woman from Canaan. Do you remember that? Here's the story. And I will make you swear by Jehovah, the Elohim of heaven and earth and the Elohim of earth that you will not take a woman for my son from the daughters of the Canaanite, Canaanites whom, among whom I dwell. Isaac and Rebekah, they felt the same way about these Canaanite women. Look what they had to say. When Esau was 40 years old, he took as wives. We know he didn't. He took Judith. This is he took Judith and Bathmeth. Uh, and they were a grief of mine to Isaac and Rebecca. Well, Rebecca, she was fed up. She sent Jacob to Haran. Actually, Isaac sent Jacob to Haran. I'm sure she was responsible for it too. Uh, and she said, I am, I am weary of my life because of the daughters of Het. If Jacob takes a wife from the daughters of Het like these, who are among the daughters of the land, but good will my life be to me. And one last time, just to drive home the point, then Isaac called Jacob and blessed him and charged him and said, you shall not take a woman from the daughters of Canaan. This is when he's going to actually send him to Haran. Okay, so she conceived for a son, son, and called his name Ur. She conceived again, bore a son, and she called his name Ona. And she conceived yet again and bore a son, three sons, and called his name Shelah, or Shila. He was at Kaziv, Kaziv, when she bore him, Kaziv. You know, I've not seen that word before. I'm sure I read it, but I never looked it up. Well, I guess I have looked it up because I have a note here. Why, why do they, why do they even mention kaziv? The, the word means deceitful. A town where Shelah, the son of Judah, was born. That's all I have to say about it. Here it is. Oh, interesting enough. I looked for it this morning looked up Kaziv, and it said, go here. It turned out to be Akziv. Here, let me show you. You can click on here. I can type C-H-E-Z-I-B and see what it says? Kaziv, Akziv, Akziv. Same, same city. And so that's where it is. Notice how close it is to Adulam. Kind of makes sense. Maybe that's where her family was living, perhaps. And she was with, 
he was with her family. I'm speculating, of course, but maybe he was with her family when she gave birth. And that's why it's mentioned. All the other ones were born in Hebron with, with his family. Regardless, I always ask, why do they say Taviv? You always got to ask, why do they say it? What, what, what am I missing? Is there something that we need to learn more? Now, a perfect example is this very next verse. Then Judah took Lakak, took a woman for her. But it doesn't say his son. It says his firstborn. How come it doesn't say son? And why does it say firstborn? Again, you have to ask yourself these kinds of questions. It says, and her name was Tamar. Who is Tamar? Torah doesn't tell us who Tamar was. So interesting. You know, he already took a woman. This is Judah took this woman. This is years later. He married a Canaanite. I wonder if he regretted marrying a Canaanite and decided that he was going to find something better for his sons. I think that's the case. Her name was Tamar. Where does Tamar come from? I put Tamar is a woman of worth. Judah took, here it is, Lecoq, a woman, Nisha, for her, his Bekor. His Bekor is exactly what it says. Here's Bekor. This here says his. That says his, his Bekor. And her name was Tamar. Now, yes, yeah, sir, delightfully, tells us who Tamar is. And in those days, Judah went to the house of Shem and took Tamar, the daughter of Elam, the son of Shem, as a woman for his firstborn earth. I think firstborn is supposed to be one word for his firstborn Ur. So this woman didn't come from Canaan. She came from the line of Shem. Oh my goodness. Do you think you're going to get a good woman going that way? I think so. Well, she's, he's not a direct son of Shem because here's Shem's seat. Shem's sons were Alam, Asher, Arfax, Edmund, and Aram. But Alam, here it is right here. Uh, I want to go where I want to go. I want to go here. Here's my H chart. Remember, we're talking about Eber. Here's Shem, a back set, Seth, then Eber. Shem is Eber's great, great. Grandfather. But they just simply say, a son of Shem, Alam. Oh, uh, Alam. Not even, not even, uh, let me, I was thinking it was Eber. Let me look again. Where's Alam? Uh, go back to where I was. There he is. Okay, Alam's not even in here. So I don't know if he's a grandson. I, I don't know where he fits into Shem. He's certainly not the son of Shem. We just listed the sons of Shem. So we know he's not a son of Shem. So he's got to be a, a grandson or a great-grandson, probably, of Shem. Just like Abraham is the, the son of Noah. Just like... Uh, all the men in the world are the seed, the sons of Adam. Oh, we got something to say about that later. Let me continue. Um, 
verse 7. It says, but earth, Judah's the core was wicked in the sight of Jehovah. Again, they're using this word, the core. They used it in six. They used it in seven. The core, the core. Didn't say son. It says the core. There's a reason why they're doing this. It says, was wicked in the sight of Yahovah, and Yahovah killed him. The word that they have there is moot. He moot him. He killed him. It appears that Ur did not want an heir from this woman of worth. Ur was not righteous. Remember, Ur's coming from where? He's a descendant of a Canaanite woman. He learned bad ways. Um, here's Moot. Uh, here it is, Moot. Moot. Killed. Die. Dead. Here, Yasher says it this way. And Ur came to his woman, Tamar, and she became his woman. And when he came to her, he outwardly destroyed his seed, and his work was evil in the sight of Yehovah, and Yehovah slew him. The word evil that they use here is this word, uh, ra or ra. This is just ra. Uh, Judah marries a pagan woman, a daughter of Canaan. All the sons of Aliyah, Aliyat, have no heirs in Torah. All three of these sons are going to be destroyed, but they're not going to have any heirs. Maybe, maybe Shelah wasn't killed by anybody outright, but he didn't get any heirs. He was never, he never became Aliyat's, or Aliyat never became his. So interesting. And Judah said to Onan, remember Onan is his second born son. Go to, go into your brother's woman. And it says, marry her, marry. You know, this is another word, marry. Many times it will say, Baal her. But this says, marry her. But again, it's the English word. We see wife. There's no word for wife in Torah. It's his woman. This happens to be his, your brother's woman. She belongs to somebody. But it says marry. Here's the word that we have for this, this thing that's being translated as marry. It's the word yamba. It's a verb. You're going to marry her and raise an heir to your brother. Now, remember, the brother is what? The Bakor. The Bakor is going to get a double blessing. Going to divide all of Judah's belongings now three ways instead of four ways. Remember when the firstborn son was there, they would have divided it four, four ways and the firstborn would have got two. And then the other two would have got one portion. But the firstborn is going to get two portions. Now Onan has the chance to get two portions of three. If he doesn't raise up a seed to his brother. Remember, well, no, you won't remember because I haven't told you yet. What's a yamba? It can be used as a verb or it can be used as a noun. The brother is a yamba, but he can yambam his brother's woman and produce a, an heir for his first brother. The heir is going to get the double portion, and then the other two brothers are going to get a single portion. Now, it's a little bit of a, of a different situation. Does he keep her once he gives her a, a, a child? If he keeps her, 
all the rest of the children are his. But the firstborn son, she might have daughter, daughter, and then a son. The firstborn son is going to be the heir, his brother's heir. All the rest of the sons are going to be his. So it's a unique situation that Yehovah has done. But if he doesn't raise an heir, again, he becomes, in a sense, the firstborn. Is he going to get the double portion? I think so. But it's not going to work out well for him. Let's watch what happens. And look what it says. Go into your brother's woman and yambam her and raise up an heir for your brother. This is the heir. That's, I mean, they're telling us right here, raise up an heir for your brother. But Onan knew the heir would not be his. It's his brother's. He wants it, the double portion. And it came to pass when he went into his brother's woman that he admitted on the ground that she should give an heir to his brother. He doesn't want his brother to have an heir and get the double abortion. Well, let me tell you, in Torah, this is in uh, Deuteronomy, here's the instructions. It says, according to Yehovah's instruction, if a brother, Akim, brothers, Akim, dwell together, and one of them dies and has no son. The widow of the dead man shall not come to a man, to, to a man, that's what it says, to a man outside the family. Her brothers, her husband's brother, this is the Yambam, this is where it's being used as a noun, uh, 2922, no, 2923. Uh, shall go bow to her and take the cock. Huh. That's his woman. And bef hear that? As his woman. So he does take her as his woman. She's going to become his. And perform the duty of a young bum to her brother. Become the duty of a husband's brother to her. Yeah, the husband's brother to her. I probably should have put this. Right. Here. Okay. To her. And then we don't need this to be italicized. And it shall be the firstborn son which she bears will succeed to the name of his dead brother. That is the name may be that is that his name may be not may not be blotted out from Israel. So you'd think because he's taking his brother's wife in Yom bombing her, she's actually becoming his woman. But the firstborn son is going to be separate. He's still going to get the double portion. Uh, Onan is going to get a single portion for he and his woman and the old brother's woman and his, his sons. Do you see how this works? He didn't want that to happen. If there's no heir, I get the blessing. I get it. That's not what Yehovah plans. Uh, so I did say, uh, but Onan knew that the heir would not be his, and it, and it came to pass when he went to his brother's woman that he admitted on the ground lest he should give an heir to his brother. And the thing, whoops, where to go? And the thing which he did displeased Yehovah, and he moot him. And Yahavah, boot him, killed him. You know, there's lots of different names for killed. Shakat is to kill. Rashak is to kill. Thou shall not Rashak. That's that's a, a intentional murder of somebody, laying in wait for them. And then we have uh, Zabak. Zavik, we kill the Zavik, we Zavik an animal uh, when we're going to eat it. There's lots of different words for kill. 
It says, Then Judah said to Tamar, his daughter-in-law, Remain a widow in your father's house till my son Shai Shila is grown. You know, I've got a teaching. I should have put it on here too. I don't even know where it is right off hand. Right off hand. Um, I suppose I could search my site. Um, about the Yamba. Uh, you probably, uh, probably if you just did a search for Yamba, you'd find it. Um, but look at what it's saying here. Then Judah said to Tamar, his daughter in law, remain a widow. In your father's house. In. Oh, he says, till my son Sheila is grown. For he said, lest he also die like his brothers. And Tamar went and dwelt in her father's house. A woman. Well, here, let me read it. A woman in Jehovah's kingdom always has a lawful covering. You know. In this day and age, we send our women off to college. We send them off to school. They're uncovered. We send them out into the world. Make a way for yourself. This is not what Yahovah intended. Every woman is to have a covering. Judah knows this. But rather than being the covering himself, and I guess in a sense he's not, he took her for his firstborn from a son of Shem. And when the firstborn died and the secondborn died, now she's got no covering, so she's going to go back to her mother. That's the way things should be. Could she have stayed under Judah's roof? Why? Until he gives her his son, she's got no part there. So she went back home. She went back to her daddy's house. Makes sense. I talk about this, A Woman's Place of Safety. I talk about this much in my five-part series called A Woman's Place of Safety. This is a link to it. If you go here, let me see if I can open it up. Yeah, here it is right here. You'll find it under creation of the woman, place of safety. And then I've got this one and the other other four uh, messages that go along with that. They're all related. Woman's place of safety is under the cover of a man. There are no single women in Jehovah's kingdom that are living according to their created purpose. There are single women, we're going to talk about them today, who are in Jehovah's kingdom, who aren't living according to his created purpose. We'll talk about them. We'll get there. So he says, first, for he said, lest he also die, uh, and Tamar went and dwelt in her father's house. Twelve. Now, in the process of time, the daughter of Shua, they still are not giving her a name. Remember, we said it was Aliat. Died. Judah's woman died. And Judah was comforted and went up. Remember, he went down the first time. Now it says he went up. This is interesting. Uh, they have uh, went up. Allah ascended, ascended. This is the, different than the first time we saw it. He went down before. Now he's ascending to his to his sheep herders. Oh, they're his sheep herders at Timna. He and his friend Hera, the Adulamites. Dula, uh, uh, Hira must have been a really good buddy. They had maybe they had some uh, business dealings even together. Yashner says this, and at the revolution of the year Aliat, Judah's woman died, 
and Judah was comforted for his woman. And after the uh, and after the death of Aliyah, Judah went up with his friend Hera to Timnah to share his sheep. Thirteen, and it was told Tamar, saying, "Look, your father-in-law is going to Timnah to shear his sheep. How long has it been? All we know is in the process of time. How long has it been that she was sent away? And now, what do you say? Go away and wear the garments of your widowhood in your father's house." How long has it been? And it was told Tamar, saying, Look, your father in law is going to up to Timnah to share his, share his sheep. Do we know where Timnah is? Uh, this one here. Timnah, there it is right there. Look at that. I always like it when you can find it on the map. So we got Adulam, Gezil, and Timnah. Hebron is where they're at. Good. A little further this time, huh? Talk about the road to Timnah. Let's take a look at that again, just so we know the road to Timnah. Where's the road to Timnah? Oh, I don't even see a road to Timnah. Here we are here. There's, you make your own way road, it looks like. They have no roads going to Timnah at this point. That doesn't mean there wasn't any, of course. Just means my map map is not sufficient. They want to put the major routes on there. Okay, so it says so. She took off her widow's garments. She'd been wearing them up until now. Covered herself with a veil, and wrapped herself, and sat in an open place, which was on the way to Timnah, for she saw that Sheila was grown. And she was not given to him. She, by all rights, was supposed to be given to Sheila. And she wasn't. So, you know, one thing we talk about in law is remedies at law. There are remedies at law. And in a sense, she's kind of making her own remedy at law. Right now, look what she does. When Judah saw her, he thought she was a harlot because she had covered her face. How did Tamar know that Judah would be interested in a harlot? These are questions we have to ask. She set herself up on the road to Timnah. Judah saw her. Realize she's probably harlots. She's got her face covered. But how did she know that Judah would even be interested in a harlot? My question is, did Judah do this often? Or was this just a one-time occurrence? I'm guessing not. This was the plight of many uncovered women in Israel. An uncovered woman in Israel, what did they do with themselves? They sold themselves. You know what? I've been dating on the internet for over a year. I think I finally found somebody. But most everyone they want to be your friend, and then they want you to send them money. Why? Because they're uncovered. They can't make it on their own. They're selling themselves. You don't even get anything. You just send them money. No, don't. If you don't like my date, don't, don't, don't send money. You find out who really cares about you if they don't ask you for money. The moment you send them money, you don't know who cares about you anymore. Never send money. So here's my question. 
is going to an uncovered woman wrong? You know, if you look at your Christian perspective, you'd say, yeah. It's a sin. But where is that in Torah? Folks, it's not there. It's not there. It's certainly not adultery because she doesn't have a man in her life. She's simply an uncovered woman. She is not covered like so many women in this day and age. They're out on their own, doing their own thing. You know, I blame, actually, maybe I'm going to have that in here. But I think I did put something in here, so let me hold that thought. She had covered her face, thought she was a harlot. Did he do that often? Good question. Uh, 38, 16. Then he turned to her, by the way, and said, please let me come to thee. For he did not know that she was his daughter-in-law. So I put, would it be okay if he knew that she was his daughter-in-law? Uh, so is it okay as long as the woman is not his daughter-in-law? No. no. I mean, that has nothing to do with it. So she said, what will thou give me? That's what they want. What do you give me? Uh, that thou may come to me. And he said, I will send a young goat from the flock. So he said, will, you, will thou give me a pledge till thou send it? In other words, you don't have the goat with you right now. When do I get my goat? What do I have for surety that you're going to give me the goat? Pledge, they call it. Then he said, what pledge shall I give thee? Then she said, no. Then he said, what pledge shall I give thee? So she said, your signet, cord, and your staff. That is in your hand. Oh, so interesting. She asked for all the things that are going to identify him personally. The signet, you know, with the signet, you you press your ring into the into the document, so it's got your your basically your signature. Your signet comes from your signature, or signature comes from signet. The cord, I'm not sure what that is. The staff is his walking staff. Somebody uses it every day. It's what he uses to defend himself if he were to be attacked. And then he gave them to her, and she went and he went to her, and she conceived by him. Oh, interesting. You know, she was owed Judah's seed, and she got Judah's seed and conceived by him. Her remedy. So she rose and went away and laid aside her veil and put on the garments of her widowhood. She's now in her father's house again. Nobody in her father's house realized that she was pregnant. And Judas sent a young goat by the hand of his friend, the Adulamite, probably Hira, or Hiram, or whatever his name was, to receive his pledge from the woman's hand. But she could not find him, but he could not find her. Then he asked the men of the place, saying, where is the harlot who is openly by the roadside? And they said, there was no harlot in this place. I put a man should notice that, that kind of thing. These men, if there was a harlot by the side of the road, they would have noticed that kind of thing. But she wasn't there long, just enough for Judah to find her. There was no harlot in this place. And he returned to Judah and said, I can't find her. Also, the men of the place said there was no harlot in the place. And Judah said, let her take them. Let her take them. The to them is the, the, uh, the signet, the, the cord, and the, and the staff. Signet, cord, and, yeah, staff. Let her take them.
Let her take them for herself, lest we be shamed. We. Why does he say we? We? Lest I be shamed. For I sent this young goat, maybe saying we because his, his friend was trying to help him, perhaps. For I sent this young goat, and you have not found her. I guess that's we. And it came to pass, about three months after Judah was told, saying, Tamar, your daughter-in-law, look at that. She's still being called your daughter-in-law. Thy daughter-in-law has played the harlot. Thy daughter-in-law. If she's thy daughter-in-law, how come she's not with Judah? She's not with Judah because then Judah will remember that she's supposed to give him to Sheila, give her to Sheila. That's why he's sending her away. Furthermore, she is with child by harlotry. So Judah said, bring her out and let her be burned. Burned. Is that what you do to a harlot? Or should I say, is that what you do to a woman who plays the harlot in her father's house, more specifically and accurately? Look what it says here about the daughter of a priest. This is Leviticus 21.9. The daughter of any priest, if she profanes, this is ka, kala, kala, kala. If she profanes by playing the harlot, she profanes, same word, she profanes, oh, I can't do that, I gotta do copy. She profanes, paste, her father. She shall be burned. Now, in 2216, uh, and this only covers the last three verses, uh, like 18 through 21 or 19 through 21. I want to go to this in whole because I want you to be able to see this. This is about stoning somebody and putting them to death. Look what it has to say here. This is, and a young man's Woman And the young woman's father shall say to the elders, I gave my daughter to this man for a woman, and he detests her. Now he charges her, he, the man, charges her with sinful conduct, saying, I found your daughter was not a virgin. Boy, how many times does that happen, that your daughter is not a virgin? These days. This was the exception to the case in those days. Hopefully, this is not going to be the exception of the case in coming days. No, hopefully, it is going to be this exception of the case in, in coming days. I found your daughter was not a virgin. And yet, and yet, these are the evidence of my daughter's virginity. So he's saying, we, the parents, are keeping track of this. Parents keep track of this. When a man takes a woman, her parents see the next morning if her hymen's been broken. There's going to be blood on the bed. And he says, and, and they shall spread the cloth before the elders of the city. Then the elders of the city shall take the man and punish him. And they shall find him a hundred shekels of silver and give him to the father of the young woman. Because he brought a bad name on a virgin of Israel. And she shall be his woman, and he cannot divorce her all his days. But, this is what I had for my verses there. I just left out the others. But, if the thing is true, and the evidence of the virginity of her virginity were not found for the young woman, then they shall bring out the young woman to the door of her father's house, the door of her father's house. Where is Judah planning on doing this? In the door of his father's house? Or the door of his house? He's talking about burning her, not stoning her. And the men of the city shall stone her to death with stones. 
because she has done a disgraceful thing in Israel to play the harlot in her father's house. So you shall put away the evil from among you. That was the end. Now, keep in mind, she's not a virgin. She's been with two other boys before that. She was supposed to go to Sheila, the other son, right? Let me go back. So here's some questions again. Would she be considered betrothed to Sheila? Would she be considered betrothed to Sheila? She was supposed to be given to Sheila. Would that be the same as being betrothed? And if it were, then Judah would have been would have had to have been stoned as well. Because he took a betrothed woman to himself. He didn't know it. That's true. I'm just speculating again. Profanes. It means to make common. Oh, that's really interesting. She makes herself common. The priest is supposed to be set apart. His daughter is supposed to be set apart. But she's been profaned, made common. To make him common. She profanes her father. She makes him common. Here, this is uh, ancient Hebrew lexicon of the Bible. It says uh, the same word, kalel, kalel, uh, to make something common that is meant to be set apart for a special function. A woman intact is supposed to be set apart for a special function. As a man circumcises himself and becomes Yehovah's bride, the bride of Yehovah, as Yehovah Baal's marries, no, as a young man Baal's a woman, a virgin, it says virgin, so Yehovah Baal's marries his sons. Oh, isn't that interesting? Whoredom makes a, oh, I know I was going to tell you about the, 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 um, circumcision. I, I was wondering where I was going with that. Um, as a man circumcises himself, Passover, and participates in the unleavened bread, or the, uh, the Passover lamb, eats the lamb, that is the covenant that he's making with Yehovah. There's blood involved in it on the man's part, and in a sense on Yehovah's part because of the slaughter of the animal. Now, when a woman comes to her man, the blood that she sheds is her hymen breaking. This was only supposed to happen one time for any woman. Obviously, it happens more than once. Some women are uh, made, made uh, widows. But the, the, the rule is, is the shedding of blood at the marriage when he takes her to become his woman. Again, women today, I'm going to be nice. It's as hard as makes a woman common. Women today, many of them are common. Common. Profaned. They don't understand. They live by pleasure. Lettery is the word. We're going to see that. Next week, when we talk about Potiphar's woman. Oh, that's an interesting story. Thanks to feminism, 
and the breakdown of the family, there are a lot of common women in the earth. I don't use the word world anymore. I have my reasons. Judah first thought Tara had played the harlot in her father's house. I'm sorry, Tamar had played the harlot in her father's house. That was what he first thought. I put funny. What would that have to do with Judah anyway? She's not in his house. Wouldn't that be for her father's concern? I think he understands more deeply that it is his concern. The fact that Judah cares indirectly shows his deeply held responsibility towards Tamar. Oh my goodness. Well, it says, when she was brought out, she gave her father, she came, she sent her father in law. She was brought out. She was brought out. Brought out where? And sent her, sent to her father in law saying, by the man to whom these belong, I am with child. And she said, please determine whose these are. The signet the cord and staff. Oh my goodness. This is going to hit Judah. He has yet, he has, he has of yet made no connection with the fact that the woman he whored with is his daughter-in-law. Now, when she is brought forth to face Judah's judgment upon her, she boldly acknowledges that the report is true. And she is willing to name the father. We should note that Tamar does not publicly shame Judah, but sends his signet, his staff, and his bracelet. Oh, they call it a bracelet on this. That's so interesting. To him privately with a note that the owner of these items is the father of her child. This note was written by uh, Glenn McWilliams as well. I think it's a great note. She didn't tell everybody. She didn't make this private. I mean, she didn't make this public. She made it private between she and he. Well, now look what happens. So Judah acknowledged them and said, look at what he says. She has been more righteous than I, because I did not give her to Sheila, my son. She has been more righteous than I. You know, these words, again, you got to look deeper. There is no such, mark my words. There is no such thing in Torah as a righteous woman. Only men can be righteous, not women. But bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh, if I'm righteous, she's righteous. I'm a son, she's a daughter. She's not righteous, she's a daughter. The righteous man is the son of Elohim. Bone of his bone, flesh of his flesh, his woman becomes a daughter of Elohim. But look at what it says. Judah acknowledged them and said, she's more righteous than I. Most Christians don't read the next verse because they just said, well, yeah, he was laying with the harlot. Is that the sin? No. Folks, get over your misunderstandings. We've learned lies. There's so much more that we need to understand. I'm trying to help you. Because I did not give her to Sheila, my son. That was the sin. And it's not that she's righteous. It's that he's failed in righteousness. That's why he's saying it that way. Now look what it says. And he never knew her again. If he never knew her again, 
that was the last time that she had any intimacy with anybody. Oh my. Now it came to pass. At that time, for giving birth, that behold, twins were in her womb. And so it was when she was giving birth that the one put out his hand and the midwives, midwife took a scarlet thread and bound it on his hand saying, this one came out first. Then it happened. Let me move this up. Uh, then it happened as he drew back his hand that his brother came out unexpectedly. And she said, how did you break through? This breach be upon you. There sometimes they say things like this. I have no idea why they say it. Why, why would that be a problem? Therefore, his name is called Perez. Now, Perez, very interesting. Tamer was never intimate with anyone again. But she got her babies. And the firstborn, Perez of Judah's seed. As the firstborn of Judah's seed, does, yeah, I guess he does. I'm wondering about Sheila. Does Sheila get anything? Looks like they're going to split it three ways and she's going to take two portions for Perez. Sira, Sira, Zira is probably going to be considered a son of Judah. Which he is a son of Judah, of course. But he's the firstborn. Perez is the firstborn of the firstborn son. What was the firstborn son's name? Uh, Shua. No, not Shua. Er, Er. His firstborn, the, the, the core. All right. So um, I said she got her babies and the firstborn prayers of Judah's seed and a true covering that is Judah. Judah is her new covering. Her father-in-law, her father was her covering. Now she's got a new covering yet again. And this time it's Judah. Perez is also the progenitor of David. David is a seed of Perez. Remember that Jacob gave Judah the kingship of the family. Now, you know, we look at this, we know the stories. Uh, I'm going to say this, please. Please, please, let's make this bold. Please put all that false, all that, all those false narratives about Jesus, Yeshua, out of your mind. All, oh, jeez, what's going on here? Uh, they, whoops. They, they all will lead you to, uh oh, okay, no, I had it right the first time. Um, all they will lead you to, uh, lead you to is eternal destruction. Do you hear what I'm saying? We've learned lies. Please put all those fault narratives about Jesus, Yeshua, out of your mind. Out of your mind. Oh my goodness, I really messed this up, didn't I? Out of your mind. They, all they will, all they, all they will, all they will lead you to, I guess that's right, all they will lead you to is eternal destruction. This false narrative given to us by the Catholic Church does not lead men into Torah and learning the way they can become a son of Elohim. We've learned lots. Follow only Yehovah's 
eternal and unchanging ways for a man and for a man's woman. That is our safety. Remember I said a man, a covering, a woman. How did it, how did it go? Uh, a woman's place of safety. A woman's place of safety is under her man. A man's place of safety is under Yahweh as his son. That's our place of safety. And that is what I teach here every week. I want you to learn this. You got to get past some of the funky ideas that we have been trained into. Doctrines and traditions of men. Look at truth over tradition. I know it's backwards, but truth over tradition. I choose truth. Choose truth. In this day and age, there's going to be so much that's coming on the world. You're going to get to the point where you thought, is there, where you're going to think, is there anything that I have learned, that I have taught, been learned, and accepted as truth, that is actually truth? Oh, you don't know what's coming. I see it. And it's coming. This is one more aspect of those lies that we have learned and accepted as truth. It sent so many people to destruction. Not Jehovah's eternal kingdom. To destruction. Because we've learned lies. We've accepted lies. You know, the lies don't make you change anything. Nothing. Nothing changes. You don't start following Yahweh's commandments, statutes, judgments, ordinances. No! We just love our neighbor as ourselves. We don't even know who we are that he's talking to and who the neighbor is that we're supposed to love. We is Israel. The neighbor is the girl who dwells with us. Not the guy who lives next door, folks. we got to learn more. Well, Next week, we're going to talk about Potiphar's woman, Z Zalika. Zalika. Torah does not do her luxury justice, but Yasher does a much better job of displaying it. Wait until you see. Not next week. Next week's good. We're going to be talking about chapter 39 of Genesis. We're going to talk about Z Zalika. We're not going to know her name, but we're going to talk about her. In brief, the following week, I believe there's close to 80 verses talking about this woman. I said that, that Torah does not do her lechery justice. Here's lechery, lewd, lewdness. Free indulgence of lust, practice of in, indulging the animal appetite, the lower nature of man appetite. That's Zelika. Oh, and wait until you see what lengths she will go to. Again, that's going to be two weeks, but next week is going to be very interesting, too. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for joining me. You guys, please have a wonderful week, and I hope, I pray that I haven't turned you off. You know what? I know. I cover a lot of things. We've learned a lot of lies. We're going to have to get past them. We're going to have to begin to renew our mind to the good and perfect will of Elohim. See you next time. Bye now, folks.